can private practice still survive? And for ASCs, clearly, uh, that's an important question to understand whether the physicians who are currently independent who may work at your facilities are still going to have that opportunity in the future, or are they going to be forced into employment, or are there other options out there? I will begin by saying, as a disclosure, that I have a certain perspective that I come from. Uh, I am, I work for a very large private orthopedic practice, a so-called supergroup, and so uh, admittedly my comments come from that perspective, but I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about the whole uh, array of issues that are facing the broader market, not just what's happening specifically in mine. But just so you understand where I'm coming from, we're an academic private practice. We began about 100 years ago, uh, or up to about 160 docs and 1,500 locations million encounters a year, a quarter billion in revenue, and we really cover the whole comprehensive array of musculoskeletal care. We don't own inpatient facilities, but we have close alignment with several different inpatient um, uh, health, uh, several different health systems and taking call at three tertiary trauma centers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is our, our geographic location. We spread throughout the Piedmont of North Carolina, which is basically the area between uh, the sand hills to the east and the mountains to the west. Um, our growth trajectory really started in the late 90s and 2000s. Uh, we had only about 20 docs when I joined the group. Uh, so you can see we've grown rapidly in terms of size and scale. Uh, and to do that, we've had to invest millions in infrastructure. And I'll go into a little bit about that and why we have done that uh, and how we've been able to get docs to come on board with this idea. Because as you know, it's not always easy to get docs to agree. Uh, and to get on the same uh, bandwagon. So we'll talk a bit about that. I think the question about what the future of private practice is really gets back to the, uh, we need to get back to the essential question. What, what's driving uh, this question? Well, I think the best thing to ask is what model is best suited for the future? That's what's gonna win. The market's gonna determine what model survives. And the things that are, the market is demanding of us currently include collaboration and integration. Uh, transparency on quality and cost, systems thinking, and I'll talk more about that, as well as innovation. Clearly, we're in a, a phase of, uh, of uh, substantial innovation. I want to touch on four basic areas. The force is driving the question, why are we in this position? Is there any inherent value in private practice? Why are we having this conversation? Why do we care? What are going to be the requirements in the new environment? And then what is the ideal platform to meet those requirements? So first, what are the forces driving the question? Well, this is not a secret to anyone. Uh, we have significantly increased complexity. A lot of that's around data. We have regulatory mandates, and then there's market dynamics around consolidation. In terms of complexity, a lot of this is driven by the increasing volume of data. Big data is real. Uh, we're being asked to contribute to that, uh, and that means that uh, groups that have previously not been on EMRs, had previously not been on digital radiology, had previously not had to worry about acronyms like uh, MU3 and ICD-10 uh, are now having to worry about those things. And if you're in a small practice or a solo practice, the idea of having to spend nights and weekends understanding regulatory mandates or read a 400-page uh, uh, um, uh, government uh, mandate is, is not something you can envision doing long term. There's also security issues. With IT comes uh, security issues as well. And so, and then there are payer changes like BPCI and CCJR and these other new payment strategies that start with Medicare and then play out in the commercial payers eventually. Probably even a bigger issue, or at least, at least equally important, is consolidation. And this plays out differently in different markets. But I can tell you in my market what happened is that the payers leveraged the primary care docs. They started with them and uh, got their payments down such that they were strapped and weren't able to make a decent living. So they all joined health systems. And now all of the primary care virtually in the Charlotte market is employed by one of two health systems. Um, and so the health systems were able to double the payments that the primary care docs made. So the primary care docs, even though they never stepped foot in a hospital, are now employed by a health system. So why are they part of the health system? It doesn't have anything to do with consolidation or integration. It has to do with the fact that they were able to double their payer contracts. So the payers then came to the specialists and said, hey, well, we, it wasn't such a great idea with the PCPs. That didn't work out. But we think we can do it with specialists because we'll get at them through their ancillaries and whatnot. And they started doing that. 
And then the specialists joined the hospitals. And then the specialists were able to increase their rates again because the health systems were able to leverage the payers. And then the payers start to consolidate and start to put pressure on the health systems. The health systems consolidate and put pressure on the payers. The health systems become payers and the payers become health systems. And ultimately, <laughs> the justification for all of this is efficiency, right? So I don't see a, a whole lot of efficiency occurring in the marketplace with all of this merger activity. What I see is increasing leverage in the marketplace and it's not necessarily driving the type change we need, but it is forcing the question of whether you can stay small. Or if you're gonna be big, what do you need to have in the marketplace that's unique to give you a position to have the conversations at the seat of the tables that you wanna be at, whether it's with payers, healthcare systems, or otherwise. What's the inherent value of private practice? And um, you know, as a private practice physician, the son of a private practice physician, the brother of a private practice physician, I certainly have a certain perspective about this, but it comes out of, first and foremost, uh, a sense of a fiduciary responsibility of being a professional. Um, there's also a sense of entrepreneurialism and self-determination, efficiency, and focus. Fiduciary responsibility simply means I have a relationship with a patient wherein one person has an obligation to act for another's benefit, not for your own. Now, physicians aren't the only ones that have this. Auditors, uh, uh, attorneys, uh, and others have these same fiduciary responsibilities. And in those realms, it's become pretty clear that the more independent a fiduciary is, the easier it is to see them uh, living up to their fiduciary responsibility. I mean, we value an external audit, an independent audit, more than an internal audit, right? And companies do as well, and certainly Sarbanes-Oxley requires things like that, and other mandates require that, and it's because uh, we know that there's a difference. If you're independent counsel or independent auditor, you may lose a client if you do something that may, if you say something in that audit or in that legal opinion that's counter to the people who hired you, but you won't lose your job. You won't lose partnership or shareholder status in your entity. Um, the same is true for physicians, and, and so physicians can be increasingly independent. They still have a fiduciary responsibility regardless of their employment, don't get me wrong. But it does raise the question in the mind of how independent you can be and are you asking somebody to risk potentially their employment to go against the needs of the system. Ultimately, physicians have a fiduciary responsibility and systems don't. And that can impact the way people think about things. Secondarily, when we're starting to think about uh, the focus, the efficiency, the entrepreneurship, sort of that self-determination piece. and, and uh, it really comes down to whether you can create a culture that's common and can you take it to scale. And this break takes me back to Jim Collins' uh, well-known book, Good to Great. How many people have met, read Good to Great or are familiar with the work? It's a very influential management book, one of the most influential of the last several decades. And it talks about some core concepts that I think really get back to what makes this a great opportunity to have a unified physician group. He talks about having the confluence of disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action. So it's people who have the same orientation generally, they talk about things the same way and think about them the same way, and then they act on those things. He also talks about the hedgehog concept, which basically says figure out what the one thing is that you do better than anybody else in the world and make that your business. And have a culture of discipline that's fanatical about doing that one thing. That is a company that can be great. And when we go for a healthcare experience, how often do we have great healthcare experiences? Okay, um, not always, right? So the market is wide open for companies that, are, that can create a great healthcare experience or that can be great in the healthcare space because there's a lot of good out there. There's a lot of pretty good out there. There's not a whole lot of great out there. And I think healthcare needs to be great. What's more important than our health? What's more important than the way we do healthcare? To me, we ought to be striving to be great. So we need disciplined people, thought, and action, and we need a culture of discipline to carry out whatever our hedgehog concept is. That all comes back to culture. And the practice culture is gonna be defined by physicians, without a doubt. Uh, physicians generally share a common mission and culture, and I would say they're part of a priesthood. When you, uh, when you go through medical training, you get trained in a way that creates a certain dogma, a certain way you look at the world, and a certain responsibility or sense of duty. That creates an affinity among physicians, and at some level, 
physicians have a greater affinity for one another than they do for their employer, regardless of who that employer is. I mean, physicians, even in competing health systems, are typically still brethren. I mean, it's kind of like Army-Navy. They're rivals. But at the end of the day, when you get attacked from the outside, we're all pointing the spears outward, right? So physicians have a great affinity for one another and a great respect for one another as being all part of that same priesthood or from that same, uh, that same training. That's a culture you can build on. Health systems have a culture that is also going to be defined by their leadership, but their leadership is going to be the administrative leadership, which may be physicians but may not. They also have a challenge that more likely they're going to have cultural complexity. I mean, let's face it, health systems are complex. They've got a broad focus, broader needs than a physician group has, and they're going to have to serve multiple masters. And they become more of a conglomerate enterprise rather than simply a corporate body, a corporate body meaning having a oneness of purpose, but a conglomerate could have multiple. It's more difficult to create and sustain a common culture in a conglomerate than it is uh, because of the disparate entities. And in addition, from a physician perspective, if you're, if you're in the church and the church isn't led by a priest, it, it raises the question of whether I'm still really working in a church. Does it really feel like I'm still able to function to my true calling if I'm not in an organization that's led by other physicians, whether it's a health system or not? So what's required? So that's the background. You've got private practices. You've got physicians who have that mentality. You've got these forces happening on top of us. What are we going to need? Well, first off, we, we have to address the issue of autonomy. Physicians talk about autonomy and how important it is to be autonomous regardless of who their employer is. So we'll explore that a little bit. Systems thinking, data management, and governance of that data and those systems. And then being willing to tolerate risk, and that requires access to capital. All of these things are on the horizon. All of these things are going to be necessary. Let's start with physician autonomy. It's the elephant in the room. Physicians have gotten away with murder forever based on this phrase, right? Physicians are autonomous. They need to be able to be independent decision makers, right? And that's true. I just made the case for that for them as a fiduciary. I agree. Physicians need to have autonomy. But over what and for what purpose? If the autonomy is to serve the patient's interests, autonomy is definitely a plus. But if the autonomy is to serve my interests and not my patient's interests, that is not a plus. So the autonomy to show up late for the OR is not the kind of autonomy that I'm talking about, right? The autonomy to use whatever implant I want, even if there's no data behind it, is not the kind of autonomy I'm talking about, right? So there's some level of autonomy that makes sense because it's patient facing. There's other autonomy that is me getting away with whatever works for me. So defining autonomy in terms of what is appropriate to have autonomy over and what's not is a key part of this consideration of how we prepare for the future. Ultimately, physicians and health systems need to be thinking in terms of what are patients looking for. And patients don't come to me for orthopedic surgery. They do not. They come to me to be healed. I have to convince my partners of that all the time. They're not coming to you for orthopedic surgery. They're coming to you to be healed. And what does being healed mean? It means to be made whole. Now, sometimes I can make you whole of body by taking out a meniscus tear or a cervical disc herniation or otherwise, but sometimes you need to be made whole of mind and spirit. And that comes down to more than medical care. That's attending to health. And there are a lot of ways to attend to health. Some of it is technical. Some of it is relational. But ultimately, patients are looking for improved quality of life. They're looking for a reasonable cost if they do need some intervention. And they want a good experience. They want a relationship. And that's what we should be creating a system to provide, not one that simply is focused on procedures and diagnoses. And our profession is starting to figure this out. The rules have changed. We used to do that before we had all the technology and the drugs and everything. Marcus Welby used to do that, right? Well, now we've got all these extra tools, which are really great. But we have to be able to use them in a context that still provides healing. So our tools have changed. The rules have changed somewhat. So we now have to figure out how to adapt to that. We were, I was trained in an apprenticeship model. There's no question that I was trained to do what my attendings did and to follow their lead and to learn how they did things. And that's how I became a surgeon. And that's how most people get trained. That's how all physicians get trained. 
is through that apprenticeship model. And what we value is whether or not a physician makes great decisions, learned decisions, and whether they have great experience, because experience will help them identify what you need and help you make better decisions. It is a very inward-facing way of viewing the world, and it's embedded in the apprenticeship model that my responsibility is to make a great decision for my patient. But if I'm a systems thinker, I look at the world differently. How many people have heard of a physician, if there are physicians in the room, how many physicians have ordered a test and it didn't get done? Yeah, that, I can't, I'm shocked. I can't believe it. Um, of course you have. And is that because, so you made a great decision, you knew they needed the test, and it didn't get done. So is that your fault? Well, the patient thinks it is because they didn't get what they needed. The patient really cares less about whether you made a great decision than whether they got what they needed. And the breakdown has been historically that we as physicians take responsibility for our own decision making, but we don't take responsibility for the system producing the right outcome. And that's a shift. So if I'm going to be outside the system as a private practice physician, am I now being asked to take responsibility for what happens throughout the system of care? And the answer is yes. In the future, that is exactly what's required. I'm going to have to shift my focus from simply making good decisions and then giving them a form and sending them out the door saying, go figure it out, in a world where it takes a PhD in healthcare economics to pay your insurance bill, or I'm going to take responsibility to make sure the patient gets what they need. And that means I've got to have help because I have to make sure that everybody on the team knows what they're supposed to do, that they have protocols that can drive what my expectations are, that they will be met, and connectivity to make sure that as things change on the fly, I can stay a part of that decision. So ultimately, we shift from autonomy to accountability, where we're part of a system and the physician is the leader of that ship of the patient's ship through the entire experience. And frankly, that's what patients want. Who else are they going to go to to make sure they get what they need if the physician can't provide that? There's no other natural successor to that role. That's why we have to do it. But there are problems with the American healthcare system, but we have the best healthcare system in the world. How many people believe that? The U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. Except it's expensive. It's poorly coordinated, it's not transparent on pricing or quality, and it's a lousy experience. But other than that, it is the best healthcare system in the world, right? So why is it like this? I mean, clearly we do have the greatest healthcare system in the world for certain things, or if you have, an, if you have a problem and you can get to the right people <laughs> and get it paid for, it's the best healthcare system in the world, right? But it is also a, sentence, a health system that has misaligned financial incentives, and I don't have to go into this in great detail. You understand that it's rewarding work done and not health improvement, and the bottom line is if I do a hip replacement on you and it gets infected and I have to take out the implant and wash it out and then I put it back in and then it fails in five years because, you, because I did it poorly, then I operate on you a redo, I get paid four times in five years. If my partner does it right the first time, he gets paid once. That's not how you want us to be incentivized, right? And everybody would agree with that, but that's how our system works today. And so we're clearly not aligning the incentives appropriately. We should be aligning it towards the people who do the best work, get either the most patients or more money. The other big piece is system failures, and I classify this as unbridled autonomy. It's us not integrating or coordinating. And so each of us have our silos, like my private practice group and the hospital and the DME provider and the nursing home. And everybody is optimizing within their silo, but nobody's, the, except for the patient, who is bumping along between each of these silos and nobody is guiding them through that, right? It's all provider focused because it's all focused on the silo, whether it's the hospital or the physician group or whoever, it's not focused on the patient. If I ask you as a patient, how big would you want my waiting room to be, what would you say? You would not want me to have a waiting room, right? You would want, but how many doctor's offices have no waiting room? None, they all have a waiting room because we're doctor focused, not patient focused. It's indicative of how we frame the system. We clearly need a systems approach to address this. Now, how do you build systems? Well, it's part technology and part culture. The complexity and efficiency demand that we have complex systems to manage it. 
if we're gonna uh, if we're gonna have infrastructure that requires scale just so we can afford it and I would argue that for governance it requires sales scale to benchmark and physicians respond to data and they respond to peer review physicians are driven by how their peers see them and are they respected by them as being good if you lose your reputation as a physician you've lost it all and so governance is a lot about benchmarking and the process of what you do with data once you get it. In terms of IT, there's a lot of layers these days. I mean, it used to be that if you simply had a data center, a practice managed system, and a phone system, you were good. Then we had to get EMR. Now we're having to get data analytics and uh, business intelligence tools. And then we're having to get patient data capture tools so we can collect patient outcomes and meaningful use data, et cetera. And then we all have different EMRs, and now we have to have tools to integrate those, like a remote, universal remote control to pull data from different EMRs. It's complicated. And you can't do this as a solo physician and have this kind of infrastructure in a reasonable way, or even in a small group or a medium-sized group. And so infrastructure is driving consolidation. It's driving the need to have some level of uh, combination of groups. Governance is as well. This is me when I was in high school, and my, my idea of shared decision making was basically if my dog was happy and I was happy, I was good, right? So I was able to make decisions pretty well on my own, right? I didn't have to take into account a lot of other people's issues. And then this happened. So um, I got married, and turns out my wife had her own ideas about you know, some of the decisions we had to make. So I had to learn to compromise. And just like when two partners come together, even if it's a two physician group, they have to figure out how to accommodate each other's needs. And then, you know, this happens. And um, so my son comes along and then we've got other priorities that we have to fit in. And of course, you know, I'm still able to have, I'm still on the executive committee of the, the group at this point. Um, but, you know, I've got other, other people I have to take into account, and then this happens. Um, and now I've got even more partners to think about, okay, but they're still, you know, I'm still on the executive committee, but now, uh-oh, okay, now the board is enlarged. So now we've got a board that's got a lot of different members, and I'm no longer the president of the group here, you know. I'm not even sure I'm getting, you know, my distribution out of this thing anymore here. And so... Uh, all of a sudden, I'm going from North Carolina to Oregon wearing a big O and saying, you know, go Ducks, you know, and how did that happen? I don't, I'm, I'm clearly not in charge of this anymore, <laughs> right? So this is the same evolution that happens with groups, right? You know, I mean, and the culture of a group changes and the governance changes over time as you get larger. And so when you're two to eight docs, you can sit, if, if you've got a table big enough in your office that everybody can sit around it, then you're in that first bucket where you have informal governance and everybody gets a vote and everybody sits around and says, yeah, we probably ought to hire a practice manager. Everybody's good with that? Yeah, we're good with that. That is governance in a small group, right? And then you get to 12 to 25 and you, you have some formal governance and you have an executive committee that may be five members that get together and talk about the business issues. But the reality is most of those groups still require unanimous votes. Now, they may not formally say that, but if the executive committee decides to do something that one or two people don't like, then they call a board meeting and they want to discuss it. And they say, we need more data. And maybe we should wait and see what happens in the marketplace. And let's revisit this in six months before we do this. And, and I think we need to do this before we do that. And pretty soon the decision making peters out and nothing has happened and they have successfully stalled that decision. Or they, it's the highest producer in the group, and they stand up and say, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to storm out, and I'll, you know, set up my own practice across the street. And, and so people say, oh, we can't afford to lose Dr. Smith, so, you know, we'll, I, guess, I guess it was a bad idea. At some point, the group gets big enough that they say to Dr. Smith, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. We're big enough. We can handle this without you. If you go set up your own deal, you're not going to have your MRI in your surgery center, and you're not going to have contracts, and maybe that's not such a good idea anymore, is it? And then we said, hey, you know, we're emboldened. We're going to have formal leadership. We're going to pay for administrative work. We're going to have a medical director. And then we start to grow, and we get more formal governance. And in fact, we have an empowered executive committee that can make decisions on behalf of the group. And frankly, the shareholders don't get to decide. They actually elect representatives who their only vote is to elect who's on the EC, right? Just like Congress. You know, you don't get to make the individual decisions. All you can do is vote them in or vote them out. 
And once you get to that level of empowerment, then maybe you get regional representation for business issues and clinical representation, uh, especially representation for clinical issues, and you get much more segmented governance, and you, def you have the people who are good at certain things, governing some things and others, others, and it becomes a fairly sophisticated governing mechanism, right? But you can't do that overnight. You can't just plop down a 150 physician group without going through that evolution, evolution because what this does is give confidence in the governance structure. If I'm used to having a say on absolutely everything and signing every check that goes out of the practice, and you put me in a group that says the only vote you have is whether we merge the group or go bankrupt, um, then that doesn't work because they don't trust that their representation is gonna be fair and that they're gonna make good decisions. But if you can evolve through that process, then you get confidence in the governance process so that people are, are able to decide things quickly and to speak with one voice. Because in that small group of leaders, they can speak with one voice and the people who they represent trust them to make those decisions. And ultimately you can get to a practice that is that has certain elements that can lead to longer-term success. I mean, for us, being physician-owned and led is key to our trust in the governance process. It really is. And, you know, transparency and accountability really go a long way towards that. Sound mechanics, customer service and stewardship, data-driven decision-making, being fair, not having sacred cows, uh, and frankly, having the same expectations for my partners who are academic researchers and those who are community orthopedists in rural North Carolina. Do the right thing for the patient, for the community, and the profession, and you will always be aligned with our mission. Everybody plays by the same rules. That way, everybody can be successful together. And you can take culture to scale because you have a discipline of culture that begins with the basis of this common orientation, this training, the dogma, the priesthood I was talking about, uh, that people gain when they go through medical school and training and when they take responsibility for patients. It changes you. I mean, it, it took a long way for me to get to the point where I could sit down with a patient and say, look, I'm going to put you to sleep, I'm going to paralyze you, I'm going to break your spine in six places, I'm going to put a foot-long rod in your back and a bunch of screws, and you're going to be better. And I actually believe that, much less they believe that, right? And so that process of not only doing being trained to do that, but actually carrying it out on a regular basis and taking that, that collective risk with patients changes physicians. And so they need to have a sense that their group acknowledges that and recognizes that and, uh, and treats that special relationship with patients in a certain way. Once you tie into that physician sense of duty, that, that sense of privilege that it is to take care of patients, the reason that they went to med school in the first place, then you openly can start articulating those physician values uh, and create them as expectations and say, you know, this is what we're about. We are about what you said you wanted to go to med school for, and we're going to hold you accountable to being those things. These are the things we say we hold people accountable to. It's quality, service, customer service, as well as clinical quality, community doing the right thing by the community. And that means that comes back not only to research and training and access, but also to pricing, because pricing is an important part of how we face the community. And then teamwork. We can't do this without a team. I've already made that point with systems. Then once you have people emboldened by the sense that they're higher quality at a lower cost, then you should, you should use that uh, to go ahead and take reasonable risk. I mean, the market should reward you ultimately if you do those things, right? And if you can move your group in a particular direction. And that's going to make you successful with these new payer contracts, right? So we've started measuring our quality. Nobody wants low quality, low cost health care, right? So we have to prove that we're high quality before we can offer it a lower cost. And that means we need to collect data on quality of life, pain and function, patient set, and safety complications and readmissions, and then we benchmark internally and with others. We even founded a national organization that benchmarks with other large uh, orthopedic practices on common metrics. So I know how my partners perform compared to the Rothman Institute and to the Cleveland Clinic and other uh, groups around the country through this network that we've created. And it's allowed us to go out and do commercial bundle payments. We do take risk on ourselves. Uh, and we've got seven, now seven actually, uh, commercial bundle relationships, mostly in hips and knees, but a little bit in spine, as well as the Medicare BPCI program. We believe in this because not only do we see it as an economic opportunity, but it is a transformation opportunity for the way that my partners think about 
their relationship with their patients and how the, the incentives should be aligned. And these are just some of our early results. The first year, we did 140 patients. These are the results, and I'm almost embarrassed to show it because you think I'm lying. But the reality is, this cohort of patients, we had no readmissions, uh, no complications except for uh, one DVT. Everybody went home uh, on an average of a day and a half, and their pain was well controlled. This was a phenomenal outcome for our patients. These were the post-op patient reported outcomes and their satisfaction rates all in the high 90s. It's a, it's a process that, that um, allows you to provide better care for patients at a lower cost and it actually works. And we've been able to replicate this now over uh, a couple of hundred patients. Ultimately, what platform is gonna meet those requirements? It's gonna be a combination of this, creating this culture and the shared decision making that I've talked about and then choosing a strategy that you can perform on. So what is strategy? Strategy is simply a set of choices designed to distinguish your organization from the competition, right? And in our case, our strategy is quality improvement and cost containment. And you have to do it intentionally with purpose, and it can distinguish you in meaningful ways. And strategy is great, but it's gotta be rooted in your organization's culture. Culture eats strategy for lunch every day. We know that, right? So you can have the best laid strategy, but if your culture doesn't support it, you might as well not start. Culture is clearly shaped by leadership or lack thereof. And as a leader, your opportunity as physicians particularly will be to, uh, determined by the organizational culture and your ability to shape that. All of this is in service of the mission, vision, and values. And ultimately, the mission is why we exist, who do we want to be, and what drives our behavior. Well, for us, that's um, providing excellence in care and service one patient at a time, being the premier musculoskeletal caregiver locally, regionally, and nationally, and doing it through quality service, teamwork, and community. And the mission and vision can change as the markets change and as needs change, but your values generally don't change. The reason you came together, who you are collectively, really doesn't change. So you gotta make sure that the values you have, which is the core part of your culture, plays out in the attitudes and behavioral norms that come out in your group. And ultimately, the values, I give this talk to residents sometimes, I talk about choosing a physician practice and I say, you just need to ask them one question, why are you in business? And then I say, you gotta give them a multiple choice answer because you know physicians won't know how to answer that question about why they're in business. Do you want it, are you wanting to take care of people, advance the field, or make money? Those are the three reasons most physicians are in practice, right? And they will all say that, well, all those things, right? Which one's first, right? So when push comes to shove, are you more interested in doing research and advancing the field and training residents, or are you more interested in being the doc that uh, gets run down by a patient in the grocery store saying you, you changed my life with the surgery you did, or are you more interested in making sure that you're financially secure? Which of those is your highest priority? Find out what the group says, and you will know if that matches with you, that's probably a good fit. If that doesn't match with you, it's probably not gonna be. Ultimately, those values and how you prioritize are gonna uh, determine your decision making. What are your access policies? Are you a caregiver of the whole community or are you a niche provider? Uh, do you work on a parity or production basis? What's the concept of fairness for the group? Is it a group, me, group first culture or me first culture? Um, and we talked about shared decision making and how that can play out. Is it patient focus or doctor focus? And is there a service orientation? Does patient sat even matter to that group? And then how does it play out in the norms? Are there agreed upon norms in the practice? And is there a trusted decision making? And what's, do I know what's expected of me from my partners? Are physicians and staff held accountable? Do, every group has rule followers and knuckleheads. There's 5% of the group who are trying to blow everything up every time, right? And so are you gonna run the group or are the behavioral norms such that the 95% that do the right thing are rewarded or that the 5% of knuckleheads are rewarded. And if you can't discipline, hold accountable the 5% of knuckleheads, then the 95% will lose their way too. Ultimately, you can do that through transparency and the power of peers. Leadership is like parenting. My wife taught me this. Um, you saw my wife. Um, setting a vision, setting an example, and then setting them straight. It's about working together under commonly accepted rules and standards to create opportunities. And once you've decided what it is you're trying to accomplish, it's fairly straightforward to grind through setting standards, measuring it, putting it out there transparently, 
doing something with it to hold people accountable and then making adaptations to make it right. And this applies not just to physician groups, it's any organization that does this. So first it's a matter of getting consensus. How do we get consensus on standards? Well, there's, doctors are smart and most of them, most doctors are the smartest people in the room, right? Every one of them is the smartest person in the room, right? But the reality is that the bigger brain is the consensus. So in the middle of the test, when you want to pull out the bigger brain, it's usually getting consensus among all the physicians in the room. And that consensus uh, can drive the standard. People think about standards or algorithms as cookbook medicine, but the reality is there are some algorithms that make sense. And if we all agree that more often than not, it makes sense to put on your pants before your shoes, Maybe we should measure how often we're actually putting on our pants first and see if we're doing the stuff that we all agree that we ought to do. And you'd be surprised how often people put their shoes on before their pants, even though everybody agrees it's better off to do it otherwise. And there are usually system reasons why that happens. So it's important to measure and then make it transparent. And frankly, getting data in front of physicians requires innovation because it's not easy to get their attention. Physicians are distracted. And so sometimes you have to find innovative ways to get that in front of people. And then you have to hold them accountable, and that takes courage. Physicians are, are averse to uh, confrontation. And so for me to come up to you and say, hey, you didn't wash your hands, dude, you know, that's not part of the normal physician culture. But if you're going to hold people accountable to the standards, you have to do that. And frankly, you also have to be willing to hold the organization accountable to the idea that maybe we're not as good as we said. We said... Before we started measuring, we said we are the best orthopedic group in the region. And then we measured. And we weren't as good as we thought. And then we had to go do something about that. And you have to be willing to do that, right? To, to go back and prove that you are, in fact, the best group in the region. I wasn't saying we weren't the best group in the region. We are the best group in the region. But, and then you have to do the analysis, right? So, okay, something's out of a line here. It could be the obvious answer that, you know, our brain's the size of a walnut and that's probably why we're not doing so well. But it's not always. And it's important to do the deep dive to figure out exactly why what's happening is happening before you go into adaptation. Because if you go down the wrong path, you will lose the faith of the group. But if, if, we, get, if we do it right, then we can apply grit to this and continue to work through it in a way that ultimately will lead to positive change. And we continue to go through it again and again. And sometimes that may feel like you're carrying the wheelbarrow through the gates of hell, but ultimately you will get to accountability or being who we say we are. That's a better way to think about accountability is you said you wanted to be this, are you this? And can you prove it? That's what this is about. So how do you create that? I mean, does employment, we started out talking about employment status. Does it affect the ability to perform on this? Well, let's take a solo practice. And, you know, mission is clearly important. And you can have a unitary mission if you're a solo practice. You define that mission. Infrastructure is challenged, though, and your impact is small. If you're large and independent, you can have a unified mission within a sector. It does require a moderate amount of infrastructure and connectivity, but you can have a large impact within a sector. If you're system employed, you have the biggest potential impact, but it's the most complex mission. And so it can be the toughest sometimes to actually grab that mission and create that impact. And so the real question becomes one of risk tolerance. You know, can you successfully scale the mission and culture? Can you generate buy-in within a specialty or across a system? That should drive your decision about whether you're employed or whether you're in a uh, super group or otherwise. Performance is going to be closely tied to the unity of mission and culture. And you have to decide, is it more important to have high performance at the expense of some level of control, maybe being great, but maybe being less controlled? Or is it more important to have high control at the expense of performance? Maybe being good, but having everything under wraps. There's clearly an advantage of being big. I'm here to tell you that I'm not advocating for solo practice in spite of my brother being a solo physician. I tell him all the time, but it's working for him now. But uh, you know, clearly the future is going to require some bigness. And it's because you need to have that governance. You need to have access to capital. You need to have benchmarking. You need to be able to develop a brand. You need to share risk. 
and you need to have specialized talent to get to the seats that matter to you. Ultimately, you know, there are places for standards and rules, and we can manage to those standards and rules. Everybody, if we know what the rules are and the standards are, everybody needs a good border collie to keep the control under wraps, or to keep the herd under wraps. But at some point, it comes to vision and leadership, and we're in an era now where things are changing, and standards and, measure and rules are not enough. We need leadership, and leadership means that you're willing to learn from your mistakes rather than punish them. It also means you have to have a learning environment where people are willing to go out there and try new things, but then also to recognize when the world has changed and be willing to see the rules and standards differently and then be prepared to seize your moment. And this is that moment. This is the airplane taking off, and most of us feel like we're the frog stuck to the bottom if we're lucky that we're not getting left behind, but it feels pretty precarious. But ultimately, it's going to be on physicians to transform healthcare, and they need to be where they feel empowered and don't feel like sheep. They don't have to be just sheep. They need to be in whatever employment structure empowers them to make change in their marketplace, to do the things collectively that we described for the betterment of their patients, not just for themselves. That's where I think the future is going. I thank you for your time and your attention.